Welcome to the North Lakes Podcast. I'm today's host, Jeremy Oswald. On this episode, we talk about Lyme disease with Tom Nickbor. Here we go. Tom Nickbor, tell me who you are and what you do here. Um, I'm a PA with North Lakes Clinic. I do a family practice in Hayward, Wisconsin. I've been here for an eternity, actually 30 years, um, coming up this October. What does PA stand for? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, it just changed. It used to be physician assistant. And um, as we developed and aged as a group, we outgrew the moniker of assistant. And so a whole, I mean, they spend millions of dollars and the whole organization research coming up with a new name that would fit what we do as more independent providers. And so they changed it to associate. <laughs> So it's physician associate now. Got it. So I, I could keep the PA. In, a ni- in the 90s, I was a PA, but I was a production assistant. Okay. Right. Yeah, so that was a whole, two, oh. two totally different things. Missed another PA. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, wanted to talk to you today about Lyme. Well, is it Lyme disease? Lyme's disease? Is, mm, what do we call it? Lyme. <laughs> yeah, it's not Lyme's disease. And it's Lyme because it was first researched in Lyme, Connecticut. And it's... Uh, I believe a city in Connecticut that had a really heavy dose of the Lyme disease way back in probably like early 80s. And they first started finding this disease. So it comes out of that area. So it's not a person. Nope. That's what I kind of always assume. Yep, it's a place. And it's not plural (laughs) or possessive. (laughs) Correct. Well, maybe if you live in Lyme's Connecticut. No, still be Lyme. Yeah. So what is it? I mean, I look just to mm-hmm. like start from the very basics. Like, what what is this? What is Lyme disease? Well, of course, anybody living up here has heard of it plenty because we're a large endemic area. Um, it's a bacterial infection, and um, it's transmitted by um, the deer tick, or they're also called the black legged tick. Um, and those are the ticks with the little orange butts, but in their immature, they're the little poppy seeds, and you can't really you know, tell the difference. Um, anyway, the tick um, carries it. They usually will pick it up. I believe the um, wood mouse or field mouse is one of the vectors, and through their stages, they'll feed on the mouse. They pick it up from the mouse, then they mutate. They come and they have a very complex life, these ticks. And they come and they um, feed on us, and they have the... Um, the Lyme bacteria, it's um, in, in them, and then they transmit it. Um, they found that it typically takes more than 24, about 24 to 36 hours for them to actually transmit the infection to you. So if you get the tick off in less than a day, your chances are only like 1% or 2%. So that's the way you get it. It's from a tick. Absolutely. And a specific okay. tick, there's no other real way to get it. No, just that one tick. Yeah, if you have a wood tick, the larger brown ticks, that's where tick identification really can help out. The larger brown ticks, no, no problems. They're not going to you know, carry any Lyme disease. And of course, these little, the deer ticks um, can also carry other diseases with them. You'll hear about like, well, I didn't just have Lyme disease, I had blah, blah, blah. You know, and they can carry something called babesiosis, which is actually a, a little parasite infection. And then there's anaplasmosis they can carry at the same time, which you become very sick. And you can actually get both at the same time, the, the Lyme and like anaplasmosis. But thankfully, you, we use the same antibiotic that treats both. So... Good to know. Yeah, it's a whole. So this happens. So I'm out mm-hmm. in the woods mm-hmm. or wherever. Get a tick on me. I get I get Lyme disease. What what happens to me? What does it do to mm-hmm. a human? Okay. Um, yeah, I actually, have kind of a whole story progress thing on there. Oh, um, don't let me. No, no. Go ahead. I don't <laughs> mean to jump ahead. No, 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 no. You're good. <laughs> um, so as I was saying, right, the only the the little deer ticks will, will carry it. Um, typically. The tick needs to be attached more than 24 or 48 hours. So if it's small and it's not those inflated gray grapes they turn into, typically your chances are, are a lot less. Um, when you remove the tick, um, the, all the infection is in the belly. So when you pull the tick off, sometimes the head's there and we'll have people come in and they're concerned they're going to get Lyme disease from that head that they pulled off. And there's no, there's no Lyme disease in the head. It's all in the belly that you pulled off. So actually the head is more of a splinter type of situation. It, it might get infected on its own, but typically in a week or two, it's going to work its way out and fall off. And so then the symptoms that you're asking about of the Lyme disease typically are going to occur three to 10 days after the, uh, after the tick bite. Um, 
and they're not very subtle. It's kind of like being hit by a truck. Uh, flu symptoms, fevers, you just feel run down and tired. Joint pains, and a lot of people are like, oh, I have joint pains. It's like, no, somebody took a bat to your knees and your hips, and it's it's really significant. Um, so you usually know when Lyme hits you. That Lyme rash that you hear about, or bullseye rash, and the interesting thing is our area rarely has the classic bullseye. And the bullseye rash is um, red around the outside. I might get this wrong. Red around the outside and clear in the center. But typically, we just see the, all, the, the whole large red rash. Um, and that only occurs maybe 50%. You don't, so the whole Lyme rash thing isn't, you know, always there. Um, it can show up where the tick bit you, um, but what's really crazy, it can show up anywhere in your body. So it doesn't have to be where the tick bit you. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Yeah. We had a young kid who came in and um, really sick and he had all the Lyme symptoms, but didn't really make any sense. And he had, uh, we'd found a little tick bite on his hip and he ended up having the rash up in his hair. Huh. <laughs> no. That's okay. Well, I'm already glad we're doing this podcast because mm. there's one myth in my life that's just been shattered. So great. Yeah. What the Lyme rash? It's yeah. Not, I just yeah. always thought it would be right where the bite is. It, typically. But yeah, I've, we've seen it. Um, and kids, interestingly, will get a bunch of them. Um, they kind of like a, a bite on their leg and they get three or four of these rashes on their chest or their back. And, hmm. and it's not, you know, a lot of times you get bit by the tick and you have that red ring around it. People we get very concerned about that. And that's always usually just bruising. It's the size of a dime. Um, you can have a red reaction around where the tick bit you. But again, they're usually a size of a dime or quarter. And the Lyme rash, which is actually called erythema migrans, if you're into all the technical names, um, it's big. It's five, six inches in diameter. It's a large rash. It doesn't itch. It doesn't hurt. It's just there. And that goes away on its own in a week. It just kind of clears out. Hmm. You know, and besides the rash, um, oftentimes, especially in this area, I think more than some of the other areas of the country, we can see something that's called Bell palsy. Um, and that's, it'll almost mimic a stroke. So sometimes people might think that they're having a stroke and, um, They may not associate the tick bite, but they will have facial drooping um, uh, left or right side of their face. And and, and I believe it's just the face. I don't think it typically affects... limbs, you know, like like a true stroke will. And um, we'll often see that even before a rash or some other symptoms early on, and they'll have a left or right-sided facial droop. And um, we've come to, especially if it's Lyme season, start looking for Lyme disease with with that type. We'll see Bell's palsy um, associated with viral infections too, but it's very interesting that it has been seen often here with uh, Lyme disease. And, oh shoot, I had another question. Um, So, um... So if how often does it happen where someone comes in and maybe they did not know they had a tick bite? It seems like the tick, like I, I always feel like I know I'm going to have it, but is it mm-hmm. often that you get people that have Lyme that didn't even know they were bitten by a tick? You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a number of that. Uh, I haven't experienced it because, you know, frequently people are, you know, looking for the ticks or they're having the symptoms and around here locally, people are just so versed on the Lyme disease. Um, that, but again, I'm, I'm certain ER would have much different stories that where they've run into people coming in with the symptoms and not being aware. Sure, because mm-hmm. I mean, you can't. They're hard to ignore. It's yeah. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know what? I'm going to take that back. There, there have been a number of times, especially in the spring when we get the the, the smaller nymph ticks, the little dark ones, and you may not even see the tick or the tick bite, but boom, you get all the symptoms. Hmm. So you definitely, yeah. Um, can can have it without noticing the the tick. It seems like that I, I don't know. Like it just like tick and lime just go hand in hand. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to like you know no shout outs to the tick, <laughs> but I mean they get a bad like they have a bad rap. <laughs> uh, I, I think they deserve it. I'm not a fan. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm like I always wonder would I rather have a mosquito or a tick, and I don't. Oh yeah. Depend, where's the mosquito bite? Yeah. Right. I don't. Know. <laughs> if you get it in like you know India, yeah. No. Okay. I'll skip it. <laughs> Yeah. Never put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> um, so 
is it hard to detect? You said that sometimes mm. it's here, sometimes it's there, sometimes mm-hmm. there's nothing. Is it is it hard to detect Lyme disease? Early on, it really is because when we test for Lyme disease, we're measuring your body's immune system reaction to the infection. And the testing that we use isn't really able to pick that up until about three weeks. They've improved it now. They say two weeks, but, you know, two to three weeks. Uh, So anything before that, you could have the infection. And if you'd run the test, you're going to be negative. Hmm. So early on, you it's kind of up to, you know, the provider that you see and, you know, we recognize the symptoms and we typically just treat it. Now, if you treat it early, a lot of people are like, well, then I want to come back at three weeks to find out if I really had it or not. It doesn't work that way because we're measuring your body's immune system reaction. If you treat it early with the antibiotic, your body doesn't mount an immune system because you're killing it. So you would even if you had had it and you check it three weeks later, there's a good chance it'll be negative. So it's kind of the art of diagnosing Lyme disease. So that um, you kind of... That you don't like take any chances like, oh, we think it might be this. You'll kind of go right ahead and treat it. Yeah. Um, you know, if there's enough enough symptoms to support it, you, you yeah, we just treat it. They do have, um, it's called prophylactic uh, antibiotic treatment, you may have heard, where within, I believe, 24, 48 hours after the tick bite, and it's, again, the deer tick, um, if... They're, they're concerned about that. We can give them two doses. The antibiotic we use is called doxycycline. And you can give them two doses. And the idea there is it prevents the infection. It's about 50-50. Um, it's, it's not 100%. But it's probably the best thing preventative. Well, it sounds like an awful from, I mean, nobody I know is like, oh, I had a light case of Lyme. Yeah. You know, like it was <laughs> right. like, it's always like, it's a, it sounds terrible. Mm-hmm. So it seems like it's a, it's worth taking the chance of like, let's just treat this. Yeah. And you have to be careful because you don't want to treat, just treat every tick bite. But you're, you're right. And if you have enough symptoms and it supports it early on, just treat it. And if, well, let's say, okay, I've been bitten by a tick Mm -hmm. and I pull it off me, Mm -hmm. is it helpful to you for me to keep that tick and bring it in with me for Mm -hmm. an appointment? Or a picture can be helpful too. Okay. Um, You know, you don't have to drag the tick around with you unless you show your friends and family. Right. But um, if you're unable to identify it, that's helpful. So that we can maybe look at the tick and if it's a wood tick, we're like, okay, you know, you're fine. Just watch for infection at the bite site and that type of deal. But then if it is a deer tick, it can, you know, raise the, we can try the prophylactic dosing, um, maybe offer blood testing at three weeks. That's another thing too is, you know, you can always do the blood test, give it three weeks. But if you've got the symptoms that happen in the meantime, well, call me, let me know. We'll, you know, we can get you treated beforehand. But some people just want to know and then you can check at three weeks. But you're not like taking the tick down to the lab and like analyzing yeah. it for Lyme. In, in the early 80s, that was the deal. I okay. think you'd send them like to Marshfield and they would do some voodoo testing or whatever. And But that, no, nobody does. I, at least that I'm aware of, nobody does. Okay, that. so that, that's run its course. So I'm not I crazy. So. I've heard this before. Oh, yeah. Like, okay. Yeah, I don't think anybody's, you know, I'll I probably think, be wrong. Somebody's going to say, you know, mm-hmm. so and so. But yeah, that's not real common. Okay. And and that's a, I, that's neat, neat to hear that it you do you don't get a subtle case of this. It sounds no. like it's mm-hmm. like you either have it, you don't, and you feel it. Like mm-hmm. the joint pain is super intense, and yeah. it, you you feel it. You do okay. flu symptoms, fevers, joint pains. The rash is fifty fifty. If you get the rash, that seals it, mm-hmm. um, and all that. Like I said, usually in three to ten days. Um, the other thing too is with. The antibiotic, there's a pretty quick turnaround on symptoms. So if somebody, if you're really suspicious, you do the antibiotic, and in 24 hours, they're feeling a lot better. It's like, oh, well, okay, well, there you go. Yeah. That's got to feel good. Yeah. It happens. Yeah. So when somebody uh, does come in, like you've already guessed, kind of named these symptoms, um, do you have moments where you're like, oh, yeah, that's Lyme? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's oh. easy to tell. Oh, yeah. It's, <laughs> they, like I said, they got the EM rash. I'm sorry, EM is that, that erythema migraines. We call it EM for short. Um, they've got the rash. They've got all the symptoms. It's it's a no-brainer. And um, specific time of year, like like I'm like we're kind of mm-hmm. doing this in the spring. I'm guessing this might be a hot time of year, but spring fall, mm-hmm. yeah. But of course, you know, year round. Um, 
And that's a hard thing. Like, they don't seem to die. No. <laughs> like they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> they are tough. I was just reading up on that the other night. And they can survive winters like below zero. And they like burrow under the litter leaf. And yeah, unless it's, I guess what's really hard from them is big swings. So if you go like really cold to really warm through the winter, that for some reason really messes them up and you get good dance. But if it's just really cold, yeah. They, don't, they just hole in. They're they're amazing. Oh my god! Okay, that's so I'm gonna get excited <laughs> when it's like really warm this day, and I'm like, oh, I can't wait for the snow, mm-hmm. like the cold, just to think all oh, the tick dying. Mm-hmm. Um, and is it uh, so? Is it a like? What about places in the country or internationally? Both. I mean, is it like? Does it happen in the desert or is it just mm-hmm. in the woods? I mean, I, I, I from what I understand, like kind of Minnesota, we're we're in a hot spot up here we in are. northern Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Um, what about the rest of the country? So yeah, pretty. I don't believe the desert. I mean, there's different tick diseases. Colorado has the Rocky Mountain spotted fever and that their own tick. And I think Texas has a different tick deal. But the Lyme is right. Um, East Coast, Connecticut, Vermont area, Wisconsin, Midwest is a hot spot. Um, Seattle area, and I think Northern California are kind of the this country's Lyme hotspots. Um, Europe's got it going. I guess Asia does. Um, Europe, again, the woodsy, a little colder, so you have like, um, um, you know, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Eastern Europe area is pretty endemic also. I believe their strain of the bacteria that infects it is a little bit different, but it still falls under the umbrella. And is it a, so is it an evolving kind of disease? I mean, is it like changed? Is Mm. it like, because I guess here's what I hear, and we Mm -hmm. don't need to dig into this too much, is that like, you know, that it's become more complex, you know, Mm -hmm. and that like it affects people in different ways Mm -hmm. or that it's getting stronger. Is that just me like listening to the, listening to too much chatter? I'm not, yeah, I'm not know what, so unlike a virus like our wonderful COVID that can mutate and change and become stronger or weaker. The the bacteria don't typically mutate. They can become resistant to and different antibiotics, but you don't see a lot of different mutations. So they usually aren't going to get stronger or weaker. Um, the Lyme has been pretty stable. Um, we've always used that antibiotic doxycycline pretty much from day one. Um, and it still is effective. It still is the number one antibiotic that we treat with it. Unless children, you have to use a uh, different antibiotic, um, and that's amoxicillin, and we've used that forever too. The thing that's changed initially uh, was three weeks of the antibiotic, and then whoops, and then they shortened that to I think it was like 14 days. Um, you know, after like 10 years, and now recently they're saying like 10 days, which is the same thing that we use for that other antibiotic or uh, infection, anaplasmosis I was telling you about. Um, so that's the only change, which is kind of weird because it's going opposite of what you're talking about, mm-hmm. which actually is kind of common in medicine that you start hot and heavy and then we pull back and we find, oh, we didn't need that much. We didn't need that much. And because, so here I'm going to just show <laughs> how silly I am or like the what I don't know the world. It's so, it's because it is not a virus, it's a bacteria. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's not a vaccine for it. No. Well, there was. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, maybe I'll re-ask that question. <laughs> I'll just ask. There, there, there are some vaccines. Okay. Um, well, they have the, the vet vaccines for Lyme. It's like, I don't know why they don't do it with humans. I'm sure for some reason. And initially, it must have been like early 90s, um, they came out with a, a Lyme vaccine. But they had to pull it from the market because the vaccine was causing arthritis. Oh. You know, so it was the Lyme. Okay. And actually, that kind of segues a little bit into, you know, people talk about, um, you know, uh, the, the Lyme symptoms if it's not being treated. So there is like the, the chronic Lyme. Typically, we pick it up because people are more aware of it now. But um, early on and occasionally now, if it's not treated early enough, and that's usually about three months, if it's left after that, you can develop some long-term complications. You can still clear it up with antibiotics. It's a longer course. It's usually maybe a month. Um, we has, we'll actually send those people to um, infectious disease specialists because they know how to eradicate the kind of the longer line. But it can cause long-term arthritis. You can develop nerve problems, um, even cardiac issues if it's not treated in enough time. And like I said, that's usually within three months. 
which brings me up to my second segue. Um, early on, I was talking about how we'll recommend um, maybe if you've been bitten or if you don't have enough symptoms to wait and treat it three weeks. And so a lot of people are like, yeah, what kind of, you're, you're, you're asking me to wait three weeks. What kind of damage is this going to do to my body? And really the answer is none. Within, within three weeks, we can treat it and you're not going to have any of those long-term complications. Excellent. And what can, I guess, like, what can people do to, to prevent it? Oh. Other than, like, be mm-hmm. careful, like, to stay away from ticks if you can. Yeah, good luck around here. Well, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, just the, the same thing, you know, we, we kind of always preach, um, you know, where, you know, the... Unfortunately, the DEET spray, you know, um, make sure that you've got socks. They talk about if you're going to be out that you tuck your pants into the socks. It doesn't give them access. But really, the most important thing is each day if you've been out and about is to do a tick check. You know, um, the whole they need to be on more than 24 hours. And if you get them off, you're, you're good to go. And the removal, the best recommendation is get yourself a little tiny pair of tweezers. And then where the tick is embedded in the skin, um, you'll have the belly sticking out, but you can kind of see the neck. You just take the tweezers and you go up close to the head right next to the skin and you pull it out backwards. And nine times out of 10, the head and everything will come out. If the head doesn't come out, you can come in. We take them out all the time or Hmm. you can leave it and it's going to work its way out. Who's your typical person that's coming in with Lyme disease? I hate to say that there's a typical one or, or isn't there? Is no. it like everybody gets it or yeah. the outdoors people or who? Every, you know, here, you know, every everybody. Um, we get more panic um, from tourists, of course, you know, coming in and um, – they, they've had it, uh, the tick bite, and of course they've heard about Lyme disease, and they may, you know, live in Florida or whatever, and um, a lot of them will want the antibiotic right away. And of course, you can't treat, you know, that's that's really important. I mean, nobody, God, nobody wants Lyme disease, and we can't do that prophylactic two-day treatment thing I was talking about. But a lot of times, people want, you know, the full course every time they have a tick bite. Well, you would be on antibiotics all summer long if you really think about how many ticks you can. Especially if you're outside and you're active, you know how many how many ticks you can have. So that's not realistic. But um, little kids up to 80 year olds, it's everybody's affected. Okay. And um, as far as um, IDing what this brown legged or deer yeah. tick looks like, you kind of I assume you know because you've been looking. But you know you've see, you know it when mm-hmm. you see it. Mm-hmm. Do you have any suggestions on someone where they can go to look to find uh, like a different yeah. what they look like? Um, and it's really, of course, the, I know Surrey County, um, they have pamphlets with lots of the pictures on it, which is really helpful. And uh, they hand those out. You can head there. Of course, just um, Dr. Google um, has lots of you know, lots of ID stuff. And you just brown, t- you know, I'm sorry, you just Google the deer tick or the brown leg and they'll show it. They're quite different um, from the normal wood tick. Um, and so once you kind of see this you're like oh yeah because they have the little orange butts and they're more oval they're not round um but in the in their their and i'm gonna forget the name they're the first stage when they're just the poppy seeds they all look the same so you kind of uh, you know mm-hmm. and that makes it much harder and anything special yeah. like are there um special populations that should be more careful around it like our older mm-hmm. people younger mm-hmm. people pregnant people you know that should be a little more um sensitive about this oh yeah you know i think definitely with uh, it, it's riskier for older um especially if they get that anaplasmosis i was talking about that can happen at the same time a lot of times i'll end up very sick and very you know, much in the hospital um anybody older especially if they're on like immunosuppressants um, you know they may have like rheumatoid arthritis or something like that or they're taking prednisone anything that would allow the infection to really take off like a wildfire there there's a lot more risk there um, so we want to get those people and when you're older too our, our immune I'm older so I can say this our immune system is not just you know cranking out like a 20 year olds right and so it's going to hit us a bit harder mm-hmm. and uh, any mm-hmm. danger of like getting it multiple times or is it easier to get after you've had it once oh. or anything like that yeah these are great questions too um, I'm going to I'm going to address that but I'm going to pull back a little bit sure sure yeah um so the you know the question is uh, on the testing 
uh, for it. You know, what what do we do, and are the tests accurate? Um, for a while, there are people um, coming around saying, kind of really spreading misinformation that the tests aren't accurate, and there's these special labs you need to do to diagnose it, which actually isn't wasn't true, and they've gone out of business. So the tests that we use. Um, it's a two-step process. There's an initial screening test that's fairly sensitive, and it tells you if you have it or not. Um, and then there's a second test that's typically done called a Western blot, and that's looking at the immune system itself and all these it's actually fairly complex. There's all these levels of antibodies that they look at. And by that test, they can tell, is this a new infection? Right? Or is this an old infection? Because once you've had the infection, your immune system has already been activated to fight it, and it's going to come back positive. So how do you know that this is new or old? So the te second test identifies new antibodies or old antibodies, and then we can decide how to treat it. Oh. So you can get infected how do you, er, you know, every year. You can get infected. You know, We've seen people, unfortunately, like twice in six months. Um, Although that testing is harder to figure out, but the the second test allows us to make that decision. Mm -hmm. I was I was just shaking my head like that. Um, I the, the the complexity of your world is amazing. <laughs> I just I, like I'm they, they so just, excited that you nailed it down. They, they, they just drill it into us. I love it. <laughs> love it. And um, so is is it if someone does get it once, is it mm -hmm. easier than like easier for them to get again, or is it worse or similar? Can you tell, or? If you think because it's a bacterial infection, so um, it's unfortunately not like a viral infection where you maybe build up more resistance. So if you think of more of it like a strep throat, you know you can keep getting strep throat over and over and the same with uh, with the Lyme disease mm -hmm. you can yeah you're not any more resistant so it's like when I get a cold it's like oh you're getting the cold again <laughs> a cold again I guess I've had one every year for you know ever right it's not like they've gotten worse over the years mm. hmm. you should be getting less I know right right I'm working on it okay <laughs> tell me a little bit more about the vaccine okay um there, I, I believe from what I've heard that they're currently working on a vaccine. Um, it's been a long haul. And I don't, unfortunately, I, I, this is way above my pay grade. I don't know what the issues have been. Back in the 80s, they had a immunization um, and they were putting out, but they had to stop it because the immunization itself was causing quite a bit of arthritis. And we're trying to prevent that with the Lyme disease. So I know that they are researching it and... And we'll keep our fingers crossed. So what motivates that research? I mean, is it, I mean, that's where I was kind of asking yeah. about like how regional it is. It mm -hmm. sounds like it's all over the nation. Right. So it's not like just a Northern Wisconsin problem. Mm -hmm. So what fuels that research? Is it the pharmaceutical companies that they can provide a benefit or is the CDC or like how, how mm -hmm. who's, who's kind of driving that ship? Well, it's always, a, yeah, the, the pharmaceuticals. I mean, you, you want to assume that their head's in a good place and they're trying to prevent a, you know, potentially bad disease. Um, of course, they make income off of it. The CDC usually doesn't drive any of that stuff, and it's all, yeah, independent pharmacies. Um, I wish I had more information on like where they are and who's researching it, but. You know. But it, I mean, it's on. It's not like <clears throat> just a. I mean, it affects a lot of people. Oh I mean, yes. So I mean, it's like a. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just like. Yeah, it's not like two thousand a year. It's, yeah. It's, we could look that number up, but it's it's a big it's a big number. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's not like it's like people are working. People are working. <laughs> yes, the people. <laughs> yes, right. Um, and so that's so that's good. I mean, and then how do you like, I guess I'm going to dig into a little bit more about your job kind of. So like, mm -hmm. how do you learn more about that? So when there's something new about Lyme disease that comes out, uh -huh. like how do how would you learn about it? Um, you mean, well, I evolved, we evolved with it initially when it kind of, and I believe it was really early eighties. They, they kind of got, kind of got going. I'd have to look that up, but we'll use that number for now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we evolved with it, and we had to because of this being, you know, such an infectious area. Um, so we really had a lot to know about it. A lot We had to know a lot about it. Interestingly, we would have um, people even getting as far south as Eau Claire early on, and the providers there didn't have a clue. 
and we're like, oh, that's just Lyme disease. And they're like, uh -huh. or, or even Madison, mm -hmm. um, that's changed. But, you know, even 10, 10 years ago, there was just kind of a, a big disconnect and it being more northern Wisconsin. As far as like new changes that go, um, we. But, but that's yeah. kind of cool. Like you were like, you know, we always think of um, <clears throat> we up north, we're like learning from down south. Oh, yeah. So it was no. kind of neat to like um, switch the roles a little bit there. The, one of the, the head people on research and treatment of Lyme disease was out of St. Mary's in Duluth. Mm. One of the infectious disease doctors, he was national. He was the guy mm. um, back in the day. So yeah, mm -hmm. we were we were pretty cutting edge. Mm. Um, now we we keep track. Um, there's a, a wonderful um, internet website that most professionals use, and it's just called Up to Date. Um, and that's where we can find all the current research and treatment recommendations for, well, for everything, but of course Lyme too. And that's, if there's any questions, then that's where we usually head to. And that's, um, all the experts keep everything current on this website. And I imagine, you know, you work with a bunch of other uh, professionals here. It mm -hmm. must be fun to be able to, when you hear something, to share it with someone you work with. Oh, absolutely. You bet. Especially if they didn't do something that you think they should have done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> then you share it right away. Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, by the way. Yeah. Right. No, I'm kidding. Yes. Um, right. Uh, and we're bouncing off each other all the time. I mean, and that that's what makes a group practice so cool because you're not isolated. You know, you maybe hear about people all the work, working alone, but no, in medicine, everybody's always talking to everybody. <sighs> And also here at North Lakes, where we do have this kind of do have an integrated uh, array of services, mm -hmm. must be nice to have a lot of different providers in the building that you can collaborate with. Yeah, if you you know you have a dental question, we can get it answered. It's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I got one last question for mm -hmm. you, Tom. Um, what's in your car right now? <laughs> I drove my motorcycle. Oh, what's in your motorcycle? Right now? <laughs> My helmet. All right. <laughs> that's um, that was a bad answer. Yeah, that is just my helmet. Well, that's all you need. Okay. Well, uh, anything else that you want to talk um, about or anything that we should uh, cover? You know, I guess just, you know, to, to reiterate, make sure you're you're doing uh, tick checks every day if you're on the woods. Use spray, use insect spray. You know, if, if you're not into the DEET, they make DEET freeze anything. Um, if you're out in the woods, tuck your pants into your socks. When you get home, do the tick checks. That's really important. Um you know, if you find the tick, um, try and identify it. You know, if not, let it let us know. We can help out. Um, pull the tick out. Use the the tweezers from the head and just pull it backwards. If the head is in, that's not a big deal. And if it is, we take them out all the time too. Um, watch for Lyme symptoms. You know, three to ten days after fevers, chills, joint pains. Um, feel like you've been hit by a truck. You know, bad flu stuff. And you definitely need to go in and get seen. Mm. I did think of something else. Mm. So a lot of friends of mine, I'm not a dog owner, but a lot of my oh. friends are. What about like when your pet has a lot of tick on them, ticks? Do they, any precautions you should take while you're, I know you're not yeah. a veterinarian. I'm no, not asking a dog, but like. Don't hug your dog all summer. You're, right. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. We're always pulling ticks off our dogs. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. So the, I guess the question is, is just that um, if you are, are you more at risk if you are a dog owner that that animal is going to bring mm -hmm. a tick in your oh, absolutely. home? So, yeah. So just keep an eye out if you're uh -huh. a dog owner. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely. I mean, that's a tick vector and you're going to be, yeah, bringing them in. Um, this is my dog, tick vector. <laughs> <laughs> Whole new name. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. Good to see you. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing so much information, Tom. I feel like I'm much better prepared to go out into the woods and fields safely. The North Lakes podcast is produced by North Lakes Community Clinic, a community health center with locations throughout northern Wisconsin. Our mission is to respond to the health care needs of our communities with an integrated array of quality services and actively remove barriers to wellness. And after this conversation with Tom, I think I can safely say that we actively remove ticks as well. Learn more about all we do here at North Lakes Community Clinic by visiting our website, nlccwi.org, or give us a call at 888-834-4551. If you have people coming to visit you and they want to learn more about Lyme disease, 
please share this episode with them and then give us a review wherever you found the episode. It helps other people find the podcast and then you can ask them what they have in their car. I'm Jeremy Oswald, marketing and communications specialist here at North Lakes. Thanks for listening.